did forget one thing before. Uh, last Saturday we had, I was I just didn't feel my mind wasn't with me. I was so overtaken by uh, the news that we had received about John that I just couldn't get my mind uh, focusing and uh, uh, seeing the situation. Others were going through the same thing. I decided to cancel the Bible study meeting on Saturday. But let's you know let's. Plan it for next Saturday at uh, 12 30, like we usually do. Do make sure you stay in prayer for Carol. By the way, Carol, you can see us right now. Let's say amen to this. We, from the most, uh, the bottom of our heart, we pass our most sincere condolence to you and to Melissa. Amen. 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 We love you. We know it's not easy for you. Everything that's going on right now in your life is. Uh, Will be very very complicated. Let me let me just do one thing. Let me bring the camera a little closer because they're having a problem listening here. Okay, let me see. Maybe you can hear better now. Okay, so let's open our Bibles, please. I mentioned last week that we would be getting into a very uh, thorny um, subject that I titled "Die to Live." <clears throat> Thinking about the title and everything that had gone on during the week, I just didn't feel that it was the message for this Sunday. I kept on uh, thinking about how death is a threat to all of us and how we all respond differently to death. Now, I would like to bring a subject that's happy, that makes you um, feel good. But uh, believe me, at the end of this message, I hope to make you a little bit stronger when you think about uh, dealing with death. So the title of this message tonight will be Life After Death. I was talking to several people this week and I said, how do you see death? And I had several reactions. I don't want to talk about it. You know, others were like, eh. uh, and uh, you know, others just don't, don't. Uh, they might have a very negative thing, uh, something very negative to say about it. like. You know, it's at the end we're all cheated. You know, so they had this, different types of reactions. And I said, so how? What should be the attitude of a Christian towards this thing that we call death? So the message today, first of all, I'd like to uh, go through uh, seven examples of wrong attitudes that we uh, that we sometimes, sometimes people have wrong attitudes towards this idea, this concept, this reality really of what death is all about. Then uh, I'll be speaking about a biblical attitude uh, that we should have concerning death. And then at the end it will be a challenge for all of us to consider uh, where we stand if we are within those who will be receiving blessing after death or those uh, who will not. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer that has the Lord's blessing upon the this message this afternoon. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, because with you, Lord, it's all positive, it's all good news. Even death, because the sting of death has been removed because of that salvation that we received in Christ. We can look forward, Lord, beyond this life into the new one with hope because we know that you, Lord, have provided a place for us in heaven. But then there might be people here this afternoon uh, who cringe when uh, you speak about this subject of death. And, uh, Lord, I pray that maybe your spirit will help me uh, to give some ideas so that we can uh, deal with this issue uh, a little stronger, a little bit more maturely, more biblically. I think it's important, Lord, that we get a biblical uh, perspective, that we adopt a biblical attitude uh, towards this, uh, this, this thing we, we call be with us, Lord, and glorify your name through this message. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I would like to look at several passages in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 5. And at the end, I'm going to read this, uh, several passages. What is it? One, two, three, you've got eight passages. And I, at once, in one voice, I'd like you to tell me what word is common to all these individuals. Chapter 5, right in the first pages of the Bible. We find a big long list of the generations of Adam, verse 1. This is the book 
of the generations of Adam. In the day God created man, in the likeness of God made him. Now let's start looking at several verses. Verse 5. In all the days of Adam lived, were, uh, that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Move over to verse 8. We see another individual. In all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Verse 11, in all the days of Enos were 900, well, I'm sorry, 905 years and he died. Verse 14, in all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. In all the days of Mahalael were 895 years and he died. And verse 20, in all the days of Jareth. Were 960 and two years and and then verse 27 all the days of Methuselah were 960 and nine years and then verse 31 and all the days of Lamech were 770 and uh, 70 and seven years and he died altogether what is the verb the thing common to all these individuals they all died. They all died. <laughs> Folks, death is very real. Sometimes we don't think about it because it doesn't touch us closely. But when a dear person, a dear brother, a, a family member, a friend who we've known for years dies, we have a brainstorm. We have go through this. Why? What's you know? It, it touches you very closely. You think. You know, you don't think about this thing called death, but it, it's so close to all of us. We see through the pages of the Bible, uh, great heroes of the faith. They lived, they did tremendous things for the Lord, but they died. None of us want to die, but all of us will. Unless, of course, we're saved and the rapture comes before, and then we'll be translated up into heaven without experiencing death. So why study a topic like this, especially in a moment like this? I think because it's sitting at, it's very close to us at this point. And I think this is a proper moment to do this. Life after death. I can give you several suggestions how to, what to have, how to have a proper attitude towards death. Why speak about this? Well, to encourage us so that we live to inherit blessings, so that we live you know, somebody said, unless you're ready to die, you're not ready to live. So to encourage us to live as to inherit blessings. Also to furnish or provide us with stimulus and theme for evangelism. Why should we be thinking about this? Because everybody, you know, that only this generation of Christians is responsible to reach, reach this generation of people in the world. We only have one generation. To do the work that God has called us to do. So when death hits us, the first thing I thought, is he saying? Yes, he is. Oh, you calm down because you know that uh, that means only good news. What else study this topic? Uh, well, to have us to help us answer inquiries and quiet deceivers. People out there will try to give you any kind of answer to this. Uh, even to the point of saying, hey, it's, you just go back to the worms, to the dust. Also to stimulate us to more fervent prayers. To strengthen our love for one another. To cause more glory to be given to God. To increase incentive to be steadfast in the faith. Now it might be proper to address again that the proper attitude towards death is the one that the Bible gives us. So anything that you think about death, instead of going to, through, you know, to superstition or tradition or public opinion, you know, the best source that you can go to to understand what this is and how to deal with this is the Bible. So if we can harmonize our conclusions and our convictions with Scripture, I think we'll be in the right direction. Now, of course, some views... Are very very strange. I was looking up, the, the, doing some studies, some research on what views out there, what people say about death, and they came up with seven that I found very very interesting. For example, did you know that atheists and even uh, 
uh, what they call the Christian scientists. This is a religion. This is a denomination. Their attitude towards uh, death is this. Uh, they believe that matter, sin, sickness, and death have no reality. They deny it completely. Or who is uh, who in essence denies the reality itself of death. It doesn't really exist. But we just, they might even, if they use scripture, they might even go to the passages that we have just read. <laughs> Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, verse 8, verse 11, verse 14, go on and on and on. And they died. They say, well, see, even the Bible says, and they died. That's it. That's the end of it. And if they ever tried to pull that one on me, I said, did you read the rest of the Bible? <laughs> People will quote scripture from the Bible and to, uh, as leverage only to, uh, then to, to, to support their, their faint or their um, idealistic ideas. Uh, but then we know that the Bible speaks more than just this is not the end. Another attitude that I came across is the one of the called the escapist who fear death and so tries to avoid all mention of it. I, in my research, I came uh, with an example of Louis XV, a friend, the King of France. His servants were forbade, they forbade his servants to even mention the word death in his presence. He was so, uh, he was so uh, uptight about it. And then I also found out that the Chinese, if you mention death in their presence, in their presence they, they, it's like an invitation to death. So you don't even mention the word death around them. <laughs> Gonna have to ask some more Chinese people if this is true or not. Maybe they were raised with different ideas. You know, these ideas, the escapists and the, the Christian or the atheists or the Christian scientists, they offer no comfort. Another attitude that I found interesting was the, was the fatalist or the stoic attitude. Now this person appears to accept it without any mention one way or another. They look at death and, and saying, and they say like, when I die, I rot and that's it. It's, have you met any of those? It doesn't worry me. Go back to the dust. Let the worms eat me. That's the end of it. You have that attitude. There was a time before I was a Christian that I think I, I had that kind of attitude. I didn't want to think about it. I thought about it. I just dismissed it with, hey, it happens. You know, don't think about it. Then you have the attitude of the blatant infidel. <laughs> this individual curses death and the God, if there is one, they say, who allows it. Who might say, death, <clears throat> that's just a dirty trick. Then you have another attitude, the attitude of the death is despairing pessimist uh, is tired of life and uh, and, he, and sometimes they just end life with suicide what does the Bible say about suicide? can we just end it that way? If we're just tired of life? well at least I can think of one passage right now where mm -hmm. God says you don't belong to yourself mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19 and 20 says what Know ye not that your body is a temple of the, of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. I met a Christian years ago, in fact, they, they used to come to this church many, many years ago, who actually committed suicide. Afterwards, I, and she came to church regularly, and I said, what, I wonder what was really in her mind when she decided to do this. Just end with it. You know, I have financial problems. I have all kinds of problems around me. Uh, and God doesn't seem to be doing anything about it. Well, I'll just end it. I have the right to take my life. Well, uh, we should know different. Then you have the attitude of the sentimentalist. Uh, this person almost gushes over the death, uh, deathbed uh, scene. They, 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 they have a romantic idea. Uh, a sentimentalist. They grow in sentiment. Um, uh, when you talk about death, it's like they're looking for it. It's like those who have that like to watch, uh, you know, uh, enjoy thrillers and, and those movies where a tear jerk is all you think, oh, I love those sentimental movies, will make me cry all through the movie. This, this, this kind of thing. 
if you have this kind of uh, attitude towards death, then you might want to visit a psychologist. <laughs> then the last one that I came across was the attitude of the religious fanatic with a martyr complex. Now we must not confuse this with the true martyrs in the faith uh, who faced inevitable, inevitable death and, and they faced it with great courage and it does not confuse, it, confuse these with those martyrs. But the, the religious fanatic uh, uh, with a martyr complex actually looks for the opportunity to die. And they always think this, well, if this is what it costs, I'm going to die for the cause. You know, they have this, uh, almost like uh, welcoming it. <clears throat> they would like, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. Although I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profited me nothing. They would just simply want to say, hey, if it, that's what it costs, I'll just die for the cross. I and mean, they're almost inviting death like it was a, a triumphant uh, situation. You have different, these are just seven of the many that you might find uh, in, in the web. And uh, of course, if you, you're entertained by any of these, then as a Christian, you need to look deeper into Scripture. How does a Christian supposed to look at death? Are we supposed to say, no, I don't want, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, I'm afraid of it. Uh, how are we supposed to deal with that, with this? So I invite you to look at at least nine passages in Scripture to understand that how uh, the Lord looks at death and how Christians from the, of the past looked at death. We'll be looking at quite a few passages from the Apostle Paul, uh, Paul's writings. Biblical attitudes towards death of the righteous. For example, are you ready? I hope you take note of this because this, if you study this at home, it will comfort you, it will give you strength, it will liberate you from any fears. You won't be looking at death like with, oh, you know, with this attitude. You'll be just, okay, it's there, uh, but I don't have to fear it. I can deal with it okay. For example, they are precious in the sight of God. The attitude towards the death, well, I don't want you to understand that the righteous, uh, are precious in the sight of God. For example, if you look at Psalm 116, verse 15, it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of the saints. How does God look, for example, at the death of Brother John? Is the Lord there just walking in, well, you know, with his arms open, ready to welcome him? Well, the Lord says that the, the death of the righteous are precious. God is very, very moved about this. Viewed from God's perspective, that simply means that one of his children, one in his family, are coming home. I love the way, you know, but not too long ago, uh, uh, there was a uh, brother, what's his name? Uh, you all know Brother Woody uh, Gilbert Wood from Brighton Baptist Church up in Germany. He, come, he used to come every year to give an intensive course. Well, his wife, Kathy, uh, her dad passed away just uh, right before the COVID. He was 90-something years old. Uh, and they knew that he was passing away. They knew that he only had either uh, days or maybe hours. And the whole family went to the hospital room and celebrated. And they filmed it. They sent me a copy and they said, Wow, I've never seen that before. They're actually, and Brother uh, uh, Wilbur, Wilbur McBride, I think was, named, was his name, he was there just happy. He was celebrating. I'm going home. It was not this gloomy, tear-jerking uh, situation where everybody went, oh, no, no, no. no, he's going home. They were looking at it from the biblical perspective, and he gave everybody comfort. Even the nurses that came in, even the doctors that came in, they said, what's going on in this room? It seems like they're celebrating. Yeah, celebrating because it's, being, it's going to be promoted to glory. The death of the righteous are precious in God's sight. Let me show you something else that the Bible tells us about the death of the righteous. They are removed from evil and uh, 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 to peace. Take note of this, Isaiah 57 verses 1 and 2. It says, The righteous perish, and no man lay it to, to heart, and merciful men are taken away, not considering 
that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come, they shall enter into peace. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in their uprighteousness. What does it mean to, for a Christian, born-again Christian, to die? It means that, hey, we'll be liberated from a lot of evil around us. How many of you agree that we're living in evil days? Especially now with this COVID thing, you just don't know how to take it. It's, everything's just going crazy. You feel like, Lord, I feel... You know, the, how many of you, raise your hand if, you, if you've had this feeling during the last year. You feel like just selling everything, buy some cottage up there in the middle of nowhere and forget about the world. How many of you say, yep, that's... I mean, I, now that nobody's looking, here I am. <laughs> I felt like, but it's a, this is... Doesn't this sound like a good idea? Hey, Brother Tim, Brother uh, Kathy. That's, that's, that's almost as good. It's, it's almost as good. Right? The cost of that cost, uh, well, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Except, you know, it wasn't to get just get away from everything. It was still right. to continue mm -hmm. serving the Lord, which is a tremendous, tremendous attitude. So what does death mean to the Christian? It means that, hey, we're leaving trouble and we're entering into our peace. This is the biblical perspective. In these times of turmoil, general turmoil, the righteous and merciful are often caught up in the loss of life. I, you know, during this pandemic, we have lost very, very dear friends. Friends we thought they would never really die. They, were, they had always been there, strong, so fervent in the Lord, serving. But then you hear this news that so-and-so passed away. Several very dear friends in the States have passed away because of either cancer, heart attack, or COVID. The most recent one was from uh, Dr. Joe Talavera, a very dear friend of ours from California. Him and his wife were very special friends. They came and visited us in Fain. They even preached here. His wife was here uh, sharing testimony. Just enjoying fellowship with everybody. Uh, Cindy was a very, very precious uh, person in our, in our lives. And then we get a call. Both of them get COVID. Joe is in quarantine, but his wife passes away in the hospital. And we're in, uh, I was in tears with Brother Joe. He's been a tower. He's been a pillar for me for many, many years. Strong Christian. And he was like a little baby to save a love of my life's companion. But then we could pray over the phone and say, Brother Joe, let's remember what Scripture tells us. Let's find comfort in Scripture. In the truth of Scripture, not in the feelings of our heart. Think about where Cindy is right now. God had a good purpose for that. But sometimes we're so caught up with things around us that we don't see the beauty even in how the Lord takes us to heaven. Also, there, there, uh, the, the death of the righteous. Uh, you know, let me just go to this place now. Come with me to Luke chapter 16. I want you to see something here that I find very, very interesting. Uh, in Luke chapter 16, verse 22. <clears throat> Luke chapter 16, verse 22. There's five words there. Four words there that I'd like you to uh, underline. In, in chapter 16, verse 22, it says, And it came to pass that the beggar died. Uh-oh, there's the word again. That's the end of it, right? Ashes to ashes. No more after death. But notice what it says. And was carried by who? The angels into Abraham's bosom. Of course, the rich man also died. And he was buried. You say, okay, well, that's the end for him. No, look at verse 23. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. But I want you to pay attention to those words. Carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom. Think about this. When your time comes, would you try to find your way up to heaven? Sometimes you see in movies that there's this big light tunnel and you get drawn by it like a, like a suction, you know, and, and you can't do anything about it. And it's like, oh, what, what's going to happen? What am I going to find at the end? Is it going to be that scary? That you know, the Bible says that, this is what it says, and the angels carried him to the presence of God. 
That's very comforting. It also tells us that the righteous are going away to paradise. Luke chapter 23. We find a very interesting passage here dealing with uh, uh, the two uh, criminals that were crucified with Christ. Uh, in chapter 23, verse uh, 43, we find this. And Jesus said unto him, notice what he said, Verily I say unto thee, Today, yet you shall be with me in paradise. Now, now what makes paradise so wonderful, so appealing? Oh, because if you look at the book of Revelation, what does it say? Streets of gold, light everywhere, just, you know, and all this... Beauty of you know this tremendous promises of well-being, but what makes heaven heaven? Me, with me. What makes heaven heaven is not those wonderful streets of gold and all the beauty that we we can find there. It is Christ. He's going to make heaven special, a special place for all of us to dwell in. So we have the angels carrying us there, and we understand by Scripture that it's a a, a, a place of list of a, a wonderful place. But I want you to see this also. If, if you uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6, the Bible also tells us, uh, gives us a word there of how this removal from earth to heaven uh, actually happens. In 2 uh, Timothy chapter 4 uh, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. Six. Paul's view uh, viewed the impending death in, as a departure uh, using a metaphor drawn from a ship that raising anchors preparing to sail out a port into the horizon. But there in chapter 4 verse 6 we see that it says, For I am now ready to be offered and the time Read those words, my departure. It's like saying, hey, I'm ready to raise anchor from this corrupted world where everything's troubled. I'm ready to take my ship. I'm ready to take my uh, voyage into home. Departure is at hand. He didn't look at death like, oh, what's going to happen? Is this finally the moment to get my train to heaven is here. My departure is ready. God, it is my time. In fact, if you, uh, if you look at how Peter puts it, uh, for example, just to turn a few more pages to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, you find this word, disease. But if you look into the dictionary, it gives you a very interesting picture. In 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, and verse 15, it says, Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease, see that word decease there? To have these things always in remembrance. What is he saying there? After my death. But if you look in the dictionary, the word you find there for decease is exodus. Exodus. It's like my exit. It is my time to leave this troubled world. It is my time to leave. Just like the, uh, the, the Israelites when they left Egypt. You think they were eager to leave? You think they were happy to leave? The time of the Exodus. They were rejoicing. Once they crossed the, the Red Sea and they were on the other side of the Red Sea, they, were, they made a tremendous celebration. Friends, you think that when we reach heaven, we're going to miss anything down here? How many of you think that we're going to miss the Costa del Sol? <laughs> How many of you think you're going to miss, even if we're out without a pandemic, enjoying uh, you know, a luxury home and beautiful you know, uh, money, abundance, and enjoying all those wonders? How many of you think we're going to be missing any of that? In heaven? No. Paul even consider it, now this is getting very extreme. Gain. How many of us this afternoon can say, like Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is? Okay. Excuse me? Talking to Canada, uh, Sharon uh, yesterday, she said, uh, she says, I, I don't want to go. I don't want to die. You know, I, I feel the 
same way. In fact, I think they, the pastor asked of the church, who wants to go to heaven? Nobody raised their hand. <laughs> now, we all want to go to heaven, but not right now. <laughs> you, know, you, you know what I mean? But Paul, when he thought about death, he said, yes, it's better for me. And I think he, he said this with, with conviction in his heart. Philippians 1.21, for to me to live, the reason for me here, to be here, is only to glorify Christ and to proclaim this wonderful message of salvation to as many people as can be. But what about if we killed you, Paul? Thank you very much, Paul would say. That, are you threatening me with death? It was D.L. Moody. When he preached in the streets over there in Chicago, they, uh, there was many who threatened him at the, out in the street. If you keep on preaching this, we'll kill you. He said, go ahead. <laughs> you think you can threaten me with death? When you have that mature idea of death and life is when you are actually liberated from fear. You don't fear it anymore. You don't welcome it. But you're not in fear. For me to live. Paul can resume it all in one name, Christ. What about death, Paul? We can kill you. Uh, you have no control of my life. Anything you do to me has to go through God's desk and stamp of approval. You think you can, you think you are really in control? God is in control. I am at God's mercy. God is powerful enough to keep me. And if he decides that I need to go home, notice what he says. Philippians chapter 1 verse 23 for I am in straight bewitched to that means uh, between I am in, in, you, you put me in a tight situation if you if I had to choose either to stay here or to go home but you know what he said if I had to choose he said it is better for me to be with Christ he put it this way for I am in straight, you know, in a, in a tight situation. I really don't know how to choose between. As if I have to choose and stay, it's only because my labor with you has not finished. That's the only reason why I want to stay. Because of the benefit that I can be to you. There's no other reason. Not just because I want to live longer years. Since my only reason for life is Christ. And if the, the Lord decides to take me home, praise God, for I am in strict bewitch to having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. And then he says, which is far better. Can we say that? How many of you would agree with me? We have a firing squad out there if you agree with me. <laughs> we can work it out in no time. He said it's game. Compare it, he says. Look at it from the biblical perspective. You know what gives me strength in the, when I have to uh, officiate, I think that's the way you say it in English, a funeral? When it, when it has to do with, I had to do my dance. It was the most um, heartbreaking thing I ever had to do. I, I was choking all through. Why? Because my dad did not know Christ as his Savior. But then my mother passed away years later. But she did. I had the privilege of leading my mother to the Lord. We had wonderful fellowship the last years that she was here. She actually died in my home. What a tremendous privilege. I'm the last of ten brothers. And she ended up in my home. You know the, the tremendous blessing that is? I was enjoying time with her. And when I, first, when I received the phone call from the hospital saying, first silence, and then I said, um, is this Mr. Perez, St. Perez? I said, yeah, this is from the hospital. Oh. My, saying, my heart sank and he said, your mom, sorry to say, just passed away. Oh, it was, oh, my mom. No, not my mom. I was broken. I said, how am I going to break this news to my family? They're going to hate me for it. But then I thought, Sammy, how about put yourself together? If you believe what the Bible says, you should be rejoicing. You should be looking at this like a promotion. So after choking and crying for a while, my, my wife said, Sammy, put yourself together. Put your mind together. Be like, uh, biblically minded. 
But then I started remembering these things and oh, this tremendous peace. I had the chance to do her memorial service. What a difference it was to speak in my mother's funeral or memorial service compared to my dad's. Joy. Those uh, family members that were all lost, by the way, who listened to me, they said, uh, it seemed like you were enjoying it. I said, from biblical perspective, yeah. What a victory this is. It's gain, he said. It's far better, Paul said. Let me give you one more. How is this uh, thing called death seen from the biblical perspective? Let's look at a couple of passages. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. And then we'll uh, skip over to chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Don't be sorry for them. Those who have no hope, yeah, you have to be sorry for them because you know what's awaiting them. But for those who, according to Scripture, they are asleep, they are just resting. Don't be sorry for them. For, his, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so then also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. It's a resting place. If you go over to chapter 5, verse 9 through 11, it gives us another, the same concept. It says, For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. I want you to underline that. Live together with Him. Is it just me? Or is this supposed to be looked at as something wonderful? We should be looking forward to this. We can be with Jesus. The righteous, those who have received Christ as a personal Savior, they can look at death and say, straight the face, I don't fear you. Because my mind has been transformed by the Scriptures. I don't have to fear you. I don't have to be scared with, uh, with the idea. Not like uh, Philip the 15, the French uh, the king who didn't want this word to be mentioned because he would just cringe under the pressure of it. Together with him. And one more just to, there's many more by the way, there's many passages on this, but let me just mention one more. What is death, the death of the righteous? How are we supposed to look at this? Well, from the rest, from our labors. I've met several men, like weird men like Brother Tim, who don't believe in retirement. The other day I was talking to my a cousin who is completely lost, has no concept of biblical life, or what life is about biblically, and he says, Sammy, I've known him for many, many years, and I knew him since I was, I was 18 years old. Before I was saved, a troublemaker. He says, Sammy, when are you going to retire? I said, Tito, his name is Tito. I said, Tito, you don't retire from Christianity. You don't retire. There's only one moment when you retire. What is that? Of course, you need to realize that you don't have the potential you used to have because you get older, but you only focus on other areas of ministry where you can work. But you don't retire from this. I knew a, a, a pastor, a friend of mine, by the way, in Armenia, who who said, I'm ready to retire. Why? He says, because I'm 65. <laughs> Since when does the age determine when you can I just want to rest. Uh, by the way, this is what I want to do when I retire. I want to start a Mexican restaurant. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I like doing Mexican food and I do the best chili. I said, brother, I, I just felt like slapping him. He says, wake up. Put yourself together. Think biblically. But he was thinking in these terms. How should we be thinking about death? Well, Revelations 14, 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. 
Those are the ones blessed. And this word blessed is double happy, doubly happy, joyful. It says, yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labor and their works do follow them. There is a retirement for Christians, but it's not in this earth, it's in heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, chapter, uh, chapter, chapter 14, verse 12 also says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus, by the way, it's talking about the body of doctrine, the body of uh, Christianity, the teachings of Jesus Christ. Those who stay in the faith, they can rest. They've understood. Now, this is the biblical uh, attitude that we should have. Are we ready to adapt, uh, adapt this to our lives, to our thinking? Can we look at, okay, again, I'm not inviting death, but we shouldn't be fearful. Some Christians today are thinking, well, what, what if I catch this COVID? You know what? Honest with you, and I don't want to sound pessimist, we're all going to catch it eventually. I was just reading an article from a man who has five doctorates specialist in many fields. He says, I don't understand why the authorities are not promoting other uh, cares of medication. They are, are available right now. So at the end, you know, even if we get vaccinated, all, every, all 7 billion people on this planet, says every year we're probably going to have to get, get another va vaccine. Just like the one you had for flu. Because there'll be a variant. I said, oh boy. This is not going to end when we get all the 70% of the population in July with a vaccine or even the 100%. This is going to be like the common flu. Does that make you happy? <laughs> Sammy, you just burst my bubble. I thought, you know, by the end of this year, at least we can get back to our lives. You know, if it's not one disease, it's another. This life is full of trouble. The Lord said, Hey, be, be confident in me. So when we look at all the things, remember we were talking about 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, everything around us, all the troubles that we have to go through, is just a light affliction compared to the glories that awaits us. Keep your eyes on the things not seen. You know when you're able to do that, what happens? A gush of joy and hope and and, uh, and uh, you, you feel relieved. You don't have to be fearful of death any longer. Now, when do you have to be fearful of death? This brings me to the last point. I'll try to be very brief. The biblical understanding of what happens to a person who dies without Christ. Just look at there are several passages with me. Uh, Luke, for example, chapter 16, verse 19. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. By the way, if you find yourself in this category, there's a way out. And it's a way out for you today, right now, tonight. You can come to Christ and receive Him. Trust Him. Receive Him as your personal Lord and Savior. Get the fear. Get the situation out of the way for once and for all. You can get vaccinated from going to hell tonight. Amen? Luke chapter 16, verse 19. We'll be reading quite a bit of passage here. There's two individuals here. One called Lazarus, and he will fall in the category of the righteous. And then you have this other man called, it doesn't even give us a name, he's a rich man. And he likes to barbecue, he likes to party. And he dies, just like Lazarus. Both die. It says, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. You know what that means? He had high cholesterol. <laughs> he would either die of that or a heart attack. He probably maybe died of both at the same time. He died. Yeah, he was probably considered a winner, a success by society, but this thing called death hit him also. There's no way out. So what happens to these two? It says, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his, at his gate full of sores. And decided to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Who's the winner here? 
The rich man? Or this beggar? Well, eternity will decide. Notice what happens after that. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Look at the first three words in verse 23. What happens to those that die without Christ? And in hell. Now that's something to fear. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. People say, oh, hell is just a idea. It's just a concept. It's not a real place. Well, what about verse 24? Very clear there. But Abraham said, it's too late, buddy. He had an opportunity when he was alive and didn't take it. He just thought about enjoying life as thinking that it was going to last forever. But then it ended. Now that you're dead, now that you're suffering in death, now is when you now is when you want to become a missionary. <laughs> Think about this. How long it would take all of us to have mission minds? Five minutes in hell would change our perspective of life completely. It would be like this man saying, Hey, please go to my five brothers, go to my family, tell them about this torment, this place. In which I am. I don't want them to come to this place. This is the rest of the story. And Abraham said, you have scripture. You have the prophets. If they don't believe the prophets, they won't even believe somebody who raises from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. you think everybody believed him after, after he rose from the dead? So you have this, a completely different story here. You don't, you have... Two stories here, one of the righteous and one of this man who never thought about God or didn't think about eternity. All he thought about was just enjoy the present. So what happens? He said, well, that man went to hell because he was a bad man. I, I have this from another lady that I talked this week. Her mom died in 96, 94. Also from COVID this week. This just last week. She asked me to pray several times for her. She had... She was in lockdown. This is not Carol, this is somebody else. She said, pray for my mom. She's in hospital right now. 94 with all kinds of health complications and COVID? Okay, I'll pray for you. <laughs> my faith really wasn't on her getting better. I was hoping that maybe she would, maybe she, she knew the Lord as her savior. And she called me, she said, my mom just passed away. And then she said this, but she was a, such a wonderful lady. She believed in God. And, you know, she was so pure. And I thought, okay, give me some more. <laughs> right now, everything's fading. She didn't say, well, and then she had Christ as her Savior. She didn't say that. I said, hmm, I need to talk to you personally. I want to show you what the Bible says. Even if you are religious, this is not going to help you. <coughs> Let me show you one very interesting passage and we'll close. This is John chapter 3, verses 1 through, through 7. This man called Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This means that this man was a very prominent individual, uh, a high-ranking religious uh, Pharisee, one probably that belonged to the Sanhedrin, the 70, who became the, the, the high court or supreme court in, uh, in Israel. He said, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art, thou art a teacher come from God. Well, is that enough to go to heaven? Just knowing that God, Jesus was a good man and a good teacher that came from God, would that be enough to make it to heaven? You might be here thinking, thinking Well, I believe in God. And I believe in many things that the Bible says. Doesn't that make me eligible to heaven? I want you to see where he says, For no man can do these things, this miracle that thou doest, except God be with them. Jesus answered and said, You know, the thing I like about Jesus, he didn't, uh, he, he went directly to the point. And he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, to thee, 
Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And me being Nicodemus would have said, do you know who you're talking to? Nicodemus would be considered like the creme, la creme de la creme, they say it in French, the cream of the crop. The top, most, most moral individual, religious individual that you could find in Jerusalem. Wouldn't that be enough to make it to heaven? Don't, doesn't those good works count for anything? Jesus is saying, no. You see, all your righteousness according to scripture are like filthy rags. You cannot buy your way into heaven. All your good deeds will not get you into heaven. When I was looking at this, I said, you know, the conversation there with Nicodemus didn't stop at verse 8. It went on to the point of verse 16, John 3, 16. Most of us know it. For God so loved the world. He's saying this to Nicodemus, that he gave his only begotten son that, so that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He, Jesus told this to a very religious Jew who was on his way to condemnation. So how do we get to heaven? By our righteous deeds? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us that it's not by works. Nobody can boast and say before God, Lord, look all the things that I did, that I, did I lived such a pure life. It doesn't work that way with God. The only righteousness that God can accept is the righteousness of Christ. And according to Romans chapter 5, that is imputed. It's a financial word. It's, a, it's an accounting word, which means he's going to put a blank number in your red account. We come before the Lord as debtors. We owe Him and God, and we have to pay with our life. And Jesus says, okay, if you want me to pay for you, I can, but you have to trust me. You have to, you have to understand what I came to do. You have to acknowledge your sinful condition and turn from that and turn towards me. And trust me with your life. Ask Jesus Christ to save you. If you haven't done it already, how do you do this? John chapter 1, verse 12. For those who received him, he, made, uh, he gave them power to become children of God. Man, sons and daughters of God. How should we look at death? If we're saved, we can smile at it and say, it's okay. It's only gain. I don't want to die right now because there's so much I want to do for the Lord. That should be the only thing that should keep you from wanting to go to heaven. But what about those unrighteous or even religious who have never received Christ as their Savior? You know what Christ is saying to you if you're in that category? You need to fear. I was witnessing to a brother, to a man at work one time back in Madrid. And I was shooting all my bullets, biblical bullets as I could, to him to bring fear to his eyes because he was mocking me. And, I, and for a while I thought I was succeeding. And he, he told me, he says, are you trying to scare me? I said, I hope so. <laughs> he says, no, there's no fear of what was going to happen at the end. I hope so. I hope we can put enough fear in your heart to make you run. To the feet of the Lord, sink there in repentance, and then call upon Him and say, Lord, only through you, only through the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Please, Lord, I beg you, I come to you as a beggar. Please come, save me, save me, make me mean your child. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. That changes everything. So where are you this afternoon? Are you standing, sitting here with fear? Well, if you're truly a born-again Christian, you shouldn't. You shouldn't have a biblical perspective. And you say, well, Sammy, I'm, I'm not sure if I die today if I would go to heaven. Would you give me the privilege to show you this afternoon how you can fix that? Would you? Let's all stand and have a word. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving us these passages this afternoon that we can uh, meditate on. Uh, Lord, there's death taking place all around us. 
both of unrighteous people who are lost in their sins. I think people who are well-meaning but uh, and very sincere, but they are sincerely lost. We would like them to see you, Lord, as their Savior. We look at other people who have lost their life, who are now enjoying eternity with you in heaven. And we rejoice for that. What tremendous joy that brings to our life, to our hearts. But Lord, I want to look at the congregation now. I don't know the condition of those here this afternoon. But I pray there's one here who does not know you yet, has not received you as their personal Savior, have not fixed this account with you. But tonight they might want to step out, maybe even call one of us and say, show me, please, show me scripture how I can fix this for once and for all. I want to have this certainty in my life. So Lord, have your spirit work in our hearts tonight. For those of us who are saved, let's not fear. Let's consider this as something uh, of benefit. And for those who do not know you, may they run to you and beg you for salvation. Work in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.